all my devotionals, the ones that I pick to choose to read and that I make a part of my life, all seem to be indicating a time of suffering and sorrow, a time of God cutting back, so to speak, of allowing maybe something that you're not used to or familiar with in your life that me personally, <laughs> I've been living with it every day since I've been born, but you know, maybe you're not used to suffering. Maybe, maybe you had this idea that uh, your Christianity was coming along and that you could always just push it off to one of those childish kind of 20 year old thoughts that, you know what, I'm healthy, I'm wealthy, I'm wise, you know, I can do it all. I have the strength of my youth and the vigor of my talents and abilities. And yet suddenly life has come crashing in on you and you've discovered, hey, you know what? There's a reason why Jesus died and why he was beaten for your suffering, why he agonized in the garden for your turmoil of soul, why he has gone through the same things that you're experiencing. Maybe Christianity hasn't turned out the way you thought it did. Maybe nobody told you that it was going to be in the world tribulation and in this life it wouldn't be prosperity but there would be poverty of soul at times as well as financial that you were supposed to give it all up in order for god to give you back what he wanted you to have and so maybe you went along and you were all content with your career choices and your motivations in being in the military or you suddenly were a government official and now the administration is changing is that really what Christianity is about for you? What you get from it? Hmm. That's sad. You know, because for me, I like and enjoy at times when suffering comes into my life because God takes away those things that aren't good for me. But not only that, it brings me slowly back to a sensitive time where even the slightest extra noise bugs me. So what do I do? I go quiet. I become still, a little more attentive to the sounds that are around me, a little more aware of just the movement of the Holy Spirit as he's trying to console me and comfort me in my distress and despair. Sometimes you can't be encouraged and you can't rejoice. Sometimes you can't be happy and sometimes you have to cry. You know, there's an interesting movie that says Courageous, I think it's called, that where I think I haven't seen it. I don't know the plot. I don't know all that stuff because I don't always get to all these shows that come out and whatever. But I guess in the story, a man cries and for some reason that seems to be such a big Oh, it's okay for men to cry. You know, if you're a guy and you don't know how to cry, you know, you're missing out. I'm sorry, man. I get choked up pretty easy, and I like that. Because, you see, Jesus wept. And if you're not in touch with yourself and you've been trained into some kind of men don't cry routine, you're full of it. <laughs> you've been lied to. <laughs> yeah. There's reasons why you have tear ducts, and it's not because it causes watering whenever, you know, there's some kind of sandstorm. You were meant to have emotions in the full spectrum of them. It's not a female thing and it's not a male thing. It's called human being. It's being alive. It's being real. It's being sensitive to your feelings and to enjoy them, whether they be sorrowful or whether they be exalted. You know, a lot of people say Jewish people are very passionate, but then the same thing can be said of Italians are passionate or a lot of different cultures are passionate. And I think that's a good thing. But to be in touch and aware of them is even better so that you can be encompassing and comforting to others who may be going through it. Because if you're a man and you've never cried, then how dare you say to a woman who's crying, buck up, or it's okay. If you can't cry with her, don't try to comfort her. Or, woman, if you become so insensitive that you can't be touched by the pleas and cries of your children, then I question whether you're a Christian at all. 
There's a hardening of heart going on and a battle for our soul. So in order to combat that, God allows suffering in your life. As dying and behold, we live. 2 Corinthians 6, 9 from Streams in the Desert. As dying and behold, we live. I had a bed of asters last summer that reached clear across my garden in the country. Oh, how gaily they bloomed. They were planted late. On the side were yet fresh blossoming flowers whose tops had gone to seed. Early frost came and I found one day that the long line of radiant beauty was seared. And I said, oh, wow, the season is too much for them and they have perished. And I bade them a fond farewell. I disliked to go and look at that bed afterwards. It looked like a graveyard of flowers. But four or five weeks ago, one of my men called my attention to the fact that along the line of that bed, there were asters coming up in great abundance. And I looked and behold, for every plant that I had thought the winter had destroyed, there were 50 little plants that it had planted. What did these frosts and surely winds do? They caught my flowers and they slew them. They cast them to the ground and they trod with snowy feet upon them. And they said, leaving their work, this is the end of you. There is no hope. You're finished. Your job is done. And the next spring, there were for every root 50 witnesses to rise up and say, by death, we live. And it is in the floral tribe, so it is in God's kingdom, such as you are. By death came everlasting life. By crucifixion and the sepulcher came the throne and the palace of the eternal God. By overthrow came victory. It is not because we conquered Satan, but rather he cast us down, and in our place, 50 Christians more arose. It's not about the victory, but it's the defeat where we become victorious. Do not be afraid to suffer. Do not be afraid to be overthrown. Do not be afraid to die for your faith. For as such were those who died, and yet, in the birth pangs of Christianity, as they follow Jesus, loving not their lives even unto death, so too we have come to the place where we know it is not about going out and setting up a kingdom, but laying down our lives so that those that we have touched and influenced by our death would rise up after us, declaring, like Stephen, like Paul, like Peter, like the disciples, like the first century, the second century, the third century Christians. Like Christians throughout all the ages, we have gone to our death, but in our place have risen up many more children of faith than we ever would have known that we touched had we but lived to see them, train them up and send them out, or rather had we died and they grew up to become mighty men and women of God. It is by being shaken to pieces and the pieces torn to shreds that men become men of might. That one a host, whereas men that yield to the appearance of things and go with the world, have their quick blossoming and they look like they succeed and their momentary prosperity. But then when their end comes, how many stay? How many realize? How many have the faith of God to continue on even unto death or rather? when the flavor of the month is gone and that exciting flowery part of the ministry that we were a part of has faded and died and the founder is gone. What if Chuck Smith dies? What if Billy Graham dies? What if, what if, what if do we become Arminians, Calvinists, Calvary Chapelites? Do we become Billy Grahamites or rather have we known all along that except that a kernel of wheat fall into the ground and die, it shall not bring forth fruit. Don't be afraid to suffer because you will die. But in your death, oh, what a glorious life you'll leave because the witness will be of Jesus that you died in the faith and that you suffered for him.